uh, interesting topic tonight. Uh, the Quran, the 1400 year solution to today's society. Um, when most non Muslims hear the term Quran, uh, their minds are often flooded with many interrogative particles like who, what, when, where, and why. What is the Quran or Quran? Is it the same as the Quran? Is it, did, did you know there's a book called the Cloran? Have you heard of that? K L O R A M. It's the handbook of the KKK. It's written in 1915 for the Quran. Obviously, very different than the Quran. Um, so, uh, Quran, Al Quran, with a definite article, means the recitation, the rehearsal. Um, it comes from a root meaning to read Qara'a. And the exact equivalent of this root, uh, para, in the Hebrew, um, also means to proclaim, to rehearse, or to repeat. Uh, this uh, verb is found some 739 times in different forms in the Hebrew Bible as well. So, uh, as the story goes, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, when he was about 35 years old, uh, he was a merchant, um, but he started to lose interest in the trade. Uh, at this point, he started having dreams, which Muslims believe uh, was the beginning of prophecy. Muslims also believe that at no point in his life did the Prophet worship idols. The Prophet was in the spirit of Abraham, his ancestors. Oh. Got it. <laughs> so, there was a group of monotheists living in Mecca called the Hunafa, and these people claimed to be in the tradition of Abraham. So these are Arabs, they're Ishmaelites, right? So they're following the traditions of their forefather, uh, Abraham, Ismail, peace be upon both of them. So the Prophet at this point, uh, he used to go to this retreat he had, it was a cave called the Ghar Hira, on Jabal al-Nur, the Mountain of Light, and he would go there to uh, do devotional practices. It's called Tehinna, which probably comes from Tehinnuf, which is Hebrew, uh, meaning some sort of devotional practice. He would uh, make dhikr, he would remember his Lord, he would contemplate the plight of his people, he would prostrate to God, things like that. Or he would just uh, go there to get away from uh, the city life, to be in solitude. So while he was there uh, on uh, the night of power, later to Qadr, or the night of destiny, as it's sometimes translated, um, he was visited by the Archangel Gabriel in human form. And Gabriel uh, came into the cave, and there's no you know, small talk, there's no you know, It was just iqra, right? it's read. So it's the fi'l amr, the imperative for read. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, who has no formal education or schooling, uh, responded, Ma'ana biqari. I cannot read, I am unlettered, I am not from the reciters. Uh, the angel repeated the command, Iqra, again, Ma'ana biqari. Third time, Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi alam bin qalam, alam al-insana ma'alam ya'alam. So the first five verses of the, ver of the Quran was revealed. Read in the name of your Lord who creates, created man from, it says, congealed drop of blood, but I don't like that translation. Read for your Lord is most bountiful, who taught man by use of the pen, taught man that which he knew not before. So I'll take that. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> this reminds me, I should shut mine off too. If it goes off, you'll understand. Um, so these are the first five verses of, I didn't mean to of the Quran. Right? And this is in chapter 96 of the Quran, right? which is interesting. You would, you would expect this to be in chapter 1 of the Quran, because it's the first five verses, but it's in chapter 96. And there's a wisdom behind that. The order of the Quran is not in chronology. Uh, it's based on how the Prophet ordered it himself. Um, so, Muslims believe also an important aspect of Islamic prophetology is that the Prophet fulfills ancient prophecy, right? So, for example, in the canonized book of Isaiah, in Proto-Isaiah in the Old Testament, there's a story of one 
uh, who receives a book, and it says, Lemor iqra in the Hebrew, which means it will be said to him, Iqra. Iqra and Iqra are the exact same word. It shall be said to him, Read. And his answer, according to Isaiah 29 12, is Lo yada'ati seifa, which literally means, I don't know letters. I can read. Ma'ana <clears throat> yaqari. And uh, according to Catholicism, there is a a law known as uh, the law of discernment of spirits. Because when the Prophet وسلم, peace be upon him, when he was first approached in the cave, he had thought that something evil had happened to him or that he had been possessed by a jinn or a demon. Uh, now this is interesting because uh, the Catholic doctrine says that when the Spirit of God comes upon a prophet, immediately he will feel a constriction and then an expansion. Whereas if it was a demon, there's an expansion and then a constriction. So the prophet felt constriction first, which according to the law of discernment of prophets, which is uh, Roman Catholic doctrine codified, uh, it was a true vision. And this is based on, uh, a, uh, on experiences of former prophets. For example, the prophet Isaiah, when he was in the temple, the Spirit of God came upon him. He was in the corner of the temple saying, what a wretched person I am, what a wretched person I am. Musa alayhi salam, the holy prophet Moses, very reluctant when God commissioned him to go to Pharaoh, pick someone else, I can't speak properly, so on and so forth. Um, Jeremiah as well. So the Quran is the revelation of God. We have to make a distinction between the revealed word of God and the inspired word of God. So for example, traditional Christians would say that the Bible is inspired by God. God inspired, not a word for word dictation but rather an expression of an author's unique understanding. So Matthew's, under, Matthew's personality is very evident in the New Testament. He quotes from the Old Testament. Luke is a physician. His Greek is very clean. You can see his personality in his work. John, a very high Christology. Paul uses sarcasm a lot in his letters. So Christians would say these are inspired by God, but articulated through a material vehicle, a human agency, a created mechanism, a human mind, a human heart, and human understanding. So Muslims have something similar to this in the Islamic tradition known as hadith. Hadith are divinely inspired statements of the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, words chosen by the Prophet to articulate divine inspiration. So God inspired the Prophet to exhort his followers to be humble. And the Prophet chose his words how to articulate that. And Many times, the prophet uses conditional clauses. That's almost his signature. You can see conditional if-then clauses. مَن تَوَادَ عَلِ اللَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ وَمَن تَكَبَّرَ وَذَعَهُ اللَّهِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالسَّلَامِ This is how he chose to articulate this inspiration from God. He said, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be debased and humiliated. humiliated. But the Quran is something different than that. The Quran is not the inspired speech of God, it's the revealed speech of God himself. Now before we get into that, we have to sort of define who is God in the Islamic tradition. God in the Islamic tradition is completely and radically transcendent of creation. He transcends space, time, and direction. And when I say he, I don't mean to imply that God is a male. This is a big deal now in graduate school. If you take classes in theology at the graduate school level, your professor may actually mark you down if you refer to God with a mas by a masculine pronoun. They'll say, use an equal number of she's, right? Or just use she, because S-H-E, the he is already in the she. So it's both. Well, certainly God doesn't have two genders. He doesn't have any gender. Uh, so this becomes problematic. Or they'll say, don't say him and himself, say God and God's self, right? Now, certainly in the Old Testament, the Hebrew refers to God as Hu, which means him. In the Quran, Hua, which means him. In the Greek in the New Testament, Autos, which means him, it's masculine. Or Hathias, the God, masculine. Hakurias, the Lord, masculine. And there's a neuter gender in Greek. It could have been neuter. That does not mean God is a male. That's how God chose to reveal himself. But it does not mean that he's male. The word Allah and the word uh, Adonai and the word Hathayas, these are grammatically male. 
you see words in Hebrew and in Arabic, all the nouns are gender five. Every noun has a gender. Okay? Some have natural gender, some have lexical or grammatical gender. For example, the word for boy has a natural gender. Boy, walad, hada, waladu, hada. It's masculine. It's a boy. It has to be masculine. Bintun, a girl, is naturally feminine. But the sun, as shamsu, the sun, as shamsu, there's nothing morphologically there that will inform you or indicate that this is a feminine word. But it is, in fact, a feminine word. So it's grammatically, it's lexically feminine, not naturally. The same with the name of God. God does not have a gender. It's no natural gender. The word itself is lexically uh, masculine. Now, interestingly, the, uh, the, the dominant attribute of uh, God in the Quran, Rahma, comes from uh, a word meaning the womb of a mother, right? The Raham. And in Hebrew, it's the same word. The Rechem means mercy of God. And the Rechem also means the womb, which encloses the fetus. So the Prophet, وسلم, under inspiration, would sometimes give examples or demonstrate divine attributes by using feminine imagery, like the woman who had lost her son, and then she, she saw him, and she picked him up, and she kissed him, and hugged him, and breastfed him. And the Prophet said to his companions who were there, and they saw this, can you imagine that woman throwing her son in a fire? And they said, la wallahi, by God, no. And he said, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. God is more merciful to his servants than this woman is to her son. So he's using feminine imagery to describe divine attributes. Right? So the prophet also is a reflection of his Lord. Muslims believe that he's the perfection of the Adamic creature. The prophet is the perfect equilibrium of Jalali attributes, Jalali meaning majestic attributes, which are predominantly found in men, like courage and fortitude and things like that, bravery, and the Jamali attributes, which are predominantly found in women. The beautiful attributes, not just physical beauty, but like mercy, uh, forbearance, things like that. Uh, in fact, uh, the Prophet's title in the Quran, Nabi al Ummi, right, has three meanings. The most dominant meaning is that it means the unlettered Prophet. Okay. Another possibility that the exegetes, the Mufassirin of the Quran, mention, Nabi al Ummi, the Gentile Prophet because the Jews at the time used to refer to the Arabs as Ummiyin, Gentiles. Another meaning is Nabi al-Ummi, the motherly prophet, because Umm means mother, the motherly prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophet in the Quran, lower your wing upon the believers. So the images are like a mother bird concealing her young or protecting her young. When uh, the prophet uh, had an uh, adopted son named Zayd ibn Haritha, and uh, Zayd's father from Bani Kalim came back into Mecca during pilgrimage and he saw his son Zayd. So he asked the Prophet for his son back. Right? Zayd was taken unlawfully and sold into slavery. The Prophet adopted him. So now Zayd's father wants Zayd back. And the Prophet said, let Zayd choose. And Zayd said, I choose no man over you. You are, you are my father and my mother. Right. The Prophet has, peace be upon him, he's a reflection of his Lord. Uh, he has both, well, he, can, uh, he has qualities of both genders um, because uh, he loved the feminine qualities. The Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, would weep frequently. He would never raise his voice. Uh, he uh, never uh, struck anyone out of anger. Um, he uh, uh, he loved children. He would pass his hands over their heads in the streets. Uh, he would greet them initially. It was very hard to preempt the Prophet with his salam. He would greet you very quickly before you can say salam to him. The one who initiates the salam, the greeting, is free of arrogance. Um, so, going back to God. God is not located anywhere in creation. He does not have an address or a residence, right? So he doesn't live at. 123 Temple Mount Boulevard, or 786 Holy Kaaba Avenue. You know, we pray to the Kaaba, we're not, we're not, we don't pray to the Kaaba, we pray in the direction of the Kaaba. It's a Qibla. Qibla means direction. Even though it's called Baytullah, right, which is a construct phrase, which can be translated the house of God, certainly God does not reside in this cube. No one believes that. 
It's a house dedicated for God. Just like the Beth El, which literally means house of God in Hebrew. No one, no Jew or Christian believes that God lives there physically. <coughs> no address, no residence. He's outside of time. It has no calendar. It's not November 17th, 2010. God. Um, so, you're not located outside of time. So, Imam Ali said, Allah who can, qabla makan, wa huwa al-an, ala ma alayhi kan. Allah was before any place, and he is now exactly where he was. The Prophet actually said that the closest a human being is to his Lord is when he is in prostration. <coughs> the closest. Okay, so God is outside of the temporal world. There's no proximity with God. As if you're in prostration, So, like, remember those miners, 2,000 feet below? If one of them in sajda, he's closer to God in reality than a man praying on the 89th floor of the Sears Tower. The, the theologians use the example of the prophet Jonah, who was fit in layers of darkness, but prostrating to God. They say he's closer to God in reality than an angel in the seventh heaven who's flying around, because he is in such that he is prostrating himself. So God isn't facing any particular direction. There's no up, down, left, right. They say the qibla, the, 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 the qibla of dua, of supplication, is the sky. So it's permissible to look up to, to supplicate. That does not mean God is located somewhere in the physical realm. It's just a direction of supplication uh, that is used to engender humility in the supplicant. So God and his attributes are completely dissimilar to creation. Yeah, so, how do Muslims reconcile their belief that the Quran is a re re revealed speech of God when the Quran is in Arabic, a created human language? So the answer to this question is at the heart of the topic tonight. How can a book written in the 7th century be relevant for a 21st century audience? God is radically unlike his creation, yet he speaks in created human, human language. So the first thing to understand is that God does not speak in any language. Not in Arabic, not in Hebrew, not in Greek, and believe it or not, not in English. Sometimes you hear people on TV say, God came to my bedside and said, my son, said, oh really? Did he sound like that? Did he have that like, country accent? <laughs> I heard it clear. Okay. Um, why? Because God, his manner of speaking is completely dissimilar to our manner of speaking. So the theologians say that the codex of the Quran, like this is called, we call it the Quran, but in reality it's the codex. This is a mushaf, right? To be technical, this is not the Quran. This is the codex of the Quran, which has the script of the Quran. They say the codex indicates upon, indicates upon, the personal pre-eternal speech of God. It's just an indication. It's called dalala, indication. The uncreatedness of the Quran is only with respect to its meanings, which are infinite, and they're not in any particular language. The Arabic indicates some of those pre-eternal meanings. This is why, this is why it's reported in hadith and in sacred sacred traditions, when the prophet was leading prayer quite often, he would come to a verse and he would repeat it hundreds of times, hundreds of times. Sometimes he'd be there a third of the night repeating the same verse. So theologians said that's because when he would repeat it, and he's instructed in the Quran to repeat the Quran, or recite the Quran in slow measured uh, verses, tones. When he was repeating these verses, more of these pre-eternal meanings would occur to his heart, so he would better elucidate or explicate uh, that portion of the revelation. However, unlike an inspired word, where the vessel will choose his words, the Arabic words of the Quran were chosen by God, chosen by God, not literally spoken by him, but chosen as a means of expressing his word. This is why the Quran, a lot of Muslims don't know this, the Quran has multiple readings. The Quran doesn't have variant readings. There's a difference between the two. There are multiple readings of the Quran because according to our tradition, the Quran was revealed in seven dialects. Right? So, you'll hear people say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawm, Right? That's fine. 
or Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Deen. A slight difference. Malik and Malik. One means owner, one means king. Both of these readings have sanad, they have transmission that goes all the way back to the Prophet, which means he recited it both ways. Both of them are correct. Okay? Because they both express some of the pre-eternal meanings of the first surah of the Quran. And these meanings are infinite. So the text is always secondary to the pre-eternal meanings. God does not speak in Arabic. Okay? He speaks in uh, a way that is completely dissimilar to us. So there are multiple meanings, multiple readings. What's the difference between a multiple reading and a variant reading? A variant reading is like what we have with Christian manuscripts, for example. Aleph 01, known as Codex Sinaiticus, found by Tischendorf, it dates to the 4th century. You'll have, for example, a chapter missing of John, or the longer ending of Mark missing. Verses that are missing, we don't have that with the Quran. What we do have is differences in uh, diacritical uh, vowel notations, or vowels, or skeletal dots. Okay, so there's different. The, the, the skeletal, the consonantal skeleton remains the same. So that's important. Um, so, with this understanding, how do we understand God's communication to Moses at the burning bush? It's not like the Charlton Heston rendition where he's walking and then there's a little bush and then he hears a voice coming from this little bush, right? Muslims understand the story that Moses uh, did not hear anything with his ear. There was no voice because God speaks to Moses directly. It's not through an agency like Gabriel, like when Gabriel came to the prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, he spoke to the prophet through exterior locution. Gabriel said words in Arabic. The prophet responded and repeated them. But here God is speaking directly to Moses. He spoke directly to Moses. So Muslim theologians would say that Musa, السلام, Moses, did not hear anything in any language that he can understand. It wasn't coming from, the voice wasn't coming from any particular direction. God chose words and put them directly into his heart through interior locution. Some of those meanings suggested, Ya Musa, inni anallah rabbul alameen. Oh Moses, I am God, the Lord of the world. Ikhla'na alayk. Take off your sandals. Idhhaba ila fir'aun, fa'innahu tawha. Go to Pharaoh, for he has transgressed beyond all bounds. What's really interesting is, the story told in the book of Exodus, it says, Vayikra elav, Vayikra, God called out to him. And the verb here is qara'a, again. The qara'a is used uh, for Moses, peace be upon him. It's used for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. God speaks by saying, recite or read. So, in this sense, the Quran is very much a living text because there are exoteric and esoteric aspects of the Quran. There may be an immediate reference for a verse of the Quran, but there's also uh, an esoteric or infinite aspect of the Quran, a moral or lesson that's good for all times. For example, um, a delegation came from Medina and they asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about the nature of the soul, the ruh. And the Prophet said, I'll do that tomorrow. And 15 days go by, and the revelation did not descend on the Prophet. So on the 15th day, finally it comes, and God tells the Prophet through the angel, don't say, Don't say, I'm going to do this tomorrow without adding, God willing. The immediate occasion was at that time, but we take a lesson from this. And what is the lesson? A universal principle is a reminder that although we have a limited choice, it is not an absolute choice, and that we should always tie things to the will of God. So this is what this is why you hear Muslims say, "Inshallah, I'll do this. Inshallah, I'll do that." The immediate occasion was the Prophet's time, but it's good for all time. So the Quran has this transcendental element to it. So meanings are dynamic. Okay, uh, the text is not dynamic, the, te the text does not change, but the interpretations will change based on qualified scholarship. One out of four human beings on planet Earth is identified, identifies him or herself as a Muslim. This is a book with an unchanging text. I think this is 
one of the greatest miracles of the Quran, that a book that has an unchanged text for 14 centuries continues to influence <coughs> millions and millions of people, right? Uh, somebody might say, well, that's in the third world. That's, you know, the, they're behind by a few centuries. Well, 20,000 people in this country every year, 20,000 Americans, I'm not talking about immigrants who move here. Uh, I'm talking about people born in this country, 20,000 a year become Muslim. Right? This book finds relevancy with them. It, it resonates with them. That, I think, is a great aspect of the Quran. So just as God is al-hayu, the living, the one who uh, transcends death, he uh, imputed, if you will, uh, upon the Quran this transcendental element, thus rendering the Quran valid uh, for all times. And this is something that religions seek, this relevancy. That's why you have these translations, for example, of the Bible, like the New Living Translation. They'll take the Greek and put it into modern, everyday English. Right? Or you have, uh, this real funny, they had the Bible for teens. So they use, like, teen language. So, for example, instead of, you know, the cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? What is that? Why hast thou? It's very archaic, it's cryptic. So the translation will say something like, OMG, you know, <laughs> this ain't cool, man. <laughs> so they're trying to give it this transcendental aspect, right, of the text. The text, they're trying to make the text transcend its time and be relevant for, for, for Americans in the 21st century. The Quran achieves that without such maneuvers. The Quran achieves that through the interpretation of the Quran by different scholars. And this is why it's very important for scholars to have requisite knowledge before they can interpret the Quran. Many Muslims think just because they know Arabic, they're a PhD in Islamic studies. Well, I'm speaking English. Does that make me, does that give me an honorary PhD in medieval Shakespearean literature? Certainly not, right? Now, to be a Muslim scholar, you need to know Arabic. You have to, have, you have to know it well. But the very fact that you know Arabic doesn't make you a scholar any more than me knowing English makes me a master of Shakespearean sonnets. Right? You have to master different levels of knowledge. 13 or 14 levels of knowledge have to be mastered in order for someone to give an authoritative opinion. That doesn't mean you can't read a verse in the Quran and say, well, that verse speaks to my heart, and this is what I'm getting from it. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But you can't go out and say, this is, this is what I think it means, and it's authoritative, and I'm going to publish this, this uh, opinion of mine. Right? And that's very dangerous. Um, so, the Quran is not a book of history, although we believe that it does describe historical events accurately. It's not a book of science, although the Quran uh, doesn't appear to make a scientific blunder. And this is the opinion of Dr. Maurice Bukai, the French scientist. You can read his book, The Bible, The Quran, and Modern Science, and he converted to Islam based on his research of the Quran from a scientific perspective. The Quran is not a deontological book of do's and don'ts. There's 6,600 verses in the Quran. 75 of those verses say, do this or don't do that. 75 verses out of 6,600. And another 450 verses explain those do's and don'ts. So roughly 500 out of 6,600. Right. It's a book of guidance. It speaks to the core of the human being, to the innate fitra or nature, the moral compass and it's supplemented by the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His wife said, his character was the Qur'an. Now there's a hadith of the Prophet where he said, fi akhir zaman, towards the end of time, la yaqa min al-Qur'an illa rasmahu. Towards the end of time, nothing remains of the Qur'an except the script of the Qur'an. Meaning no one understands the meanings of the Qur'an anymore. And this is something that is problematic. And this is something that Muslims recognize as being a problem, that we need qualified scholarship that has what's known as sanad, or a chain of transmission. The first hadith that children learn in traditional schools of, uh, of Islamic uh, uh, education is the hadith of the Prophet where he said, Irhamu man fil yarhamukum man fil sama. Have mercy to those on earth, and the one in heaven will show you mercy. It's a very short statement. But they also memorize the entire chain of transmission, which takes about 15 minutes 
or 20 minutes to recite because transmission is very important. Where are you getting your knowledge from? And you think, well, it's only about 32 names. That's not very hard. But some of the names are like Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Hassan ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad. Heard from Muhammad ibn Hassan ibn Muhammad. It's, it, it gets very complicated, right? But it's very important to know the chain of transmission. This is why Muslims value things like genealogies and credentials, right? Before someone gets up and speaks, right? Wink, wink. They should have credentials. <laughs> Don't take their information unless it's a reliable source. So think about that one. <laughs> so oftentimes in our society, we see this inverse relationship between information and knowledge. You would think the more information that's out there, the more knowledgeable people are, right? But we're living in an age of information. You can go on the internet and find a billion articles about Islam. But why aren't people becoming more knowledgeable? Why is ignorance increasing? Why the inverse relationship? The problem is because information is only converted into knowledge when the source of the information is authoritative. It has to be authoritative, the source. So, for example, I use this example a lot. If Kermit the Frog tells you not to drink Diet Coke because it gives you osteoporosis, would you believe Kermit the Frog? Kermit the Frog here. <laughs> Don't drink Diet Coke. He would probably say, you know, Kermit, he's a puppet. Or if Elmo tells you that, they'll say Elmo is a monster. His best friend is Cookie Monster. He's an addict. He can't control himself. I'm not going to believe Cookie Monster. But if Dr. Oz, whose first name is Muhammad, by the way, did you guys know that? Yeah, it's Mehmet, which is an apocopated form of Muhammad. He's from Turkey. Of course, you never hear about his first name. And there's a good reason for that. You always hear about Oprah, Geraldo, right? Saudi Jesse, Ricky Lake, Phil Donahue. Then you say, what's Oz's first name? Doctor? <laughs> it's Muhammad Oz. Yeah. If he says, don't drink Diet Coke because it gives you osteoporosis, you might say, you know what? Dr. Oz, he's a doctor, and I'm going to switch to Diet Pepsi. <laughs> because it's all about the source. So the problem we have today in our contemporary society is you have a bunch of Elmos and Kermit the Frogs wearing Dr. Oz costumes and speaking for Islam. That's what's going on, whether they're Muslim or not. You have these, these pundits, uh, these 9-11 these opportunists to go on TV and say unbelievably inaccurate things about Islam. I'll give you an example. I saw this guy on uh, one of these Christian channels and you remember the heat stamp that came out? Okay. It looked like this. And then it said, Eid Mubarak here in Arabic calligraphy. Right? He showed us on, not joking, he showed us on TV and he said, look, if you get a letter with this stamp on it, don't open your, your mail. Because Muslims read from right to left. Die. <laughs> <laughs> I was, in a, I was in a Starbucks recently. Uh, yeah, I know, about, I know about Starbucks. I just needed, I was craving a frap. And uh, there, was a, there was an older man there who tried to, you know, give his spiel about his belief. And I, he was saying things like this. And I said, you know, you really shouldn't listen to Pat Robertson and these guys. They don't really know what they're talking about. And I showed him this. I said, look, this, this is what one of them said. And when I showed him this, his reaction surprised me. Because he went, would you look at that? <laughs> and then I said, yeah. And if you write, Mubarak, Karaboom! <laughs> and then he realized I was sassing him. <laughs> So when we say the Quran is a 1,400-year solution, this is first and foremost a faith conviction. However, it is a faith conviction rooted in concrete life experiences. The Quran continues to change millions of lives. It's too difficult to dismiss just the effect of the Quran. Not even going into the text of it yet, just the effects of the Quran. It's too difficult to dismiss. Something I find wonderful about the Quran is that it ad directly addresses different groups of people. It addresses believers, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, right? It addresses unbelievers. It addresses directly Jews and Christians, Ya ahl al-kitab. Ahl al-kitab means people of the book. What book? The Bible. 
people of the Bible. And it describes for the Muslims who are Ahlul Kitab. Laysu Sawa'a min Ahlul Kitab. They're not all the same. <coughs> They're very different, just like Muslims are very different. You have a group of Ahlul Kitab uh, that uh, are in complete disagreement with other groups. Read a book by Chris Hedges. Have you heard of Chris Hedges? A great Christian scholar. Very brilliant man. He has a book called uh, American Fascism, in which he uh, talks about these militarized uh, evangelical generals in the Pentagon, the cathedral in D.C., who believe it is their duty to go tame the wild Ishmaelite, right, and bring them the gospel, and uh, so on and so forth, believing in going in and, and, and taking over countries, this type of uh, imperial building, empire building mentality. The vast majority of Christians find this idea very troubling. The vast majority, Chris Hedges himself, is a Christian from Harvard Seminary. Right. They're not all the same. This is uh, very important. Christians would say also that God does have a preferential aspect, that God is with the oppressed. He's with the downtrodden. He's with the marginalized in society, that he's not necessarily with the militarized general who wants to go and, and, and take countries over. Right? The vast majority of Christians would agree with that. In fact, Vatican II in 1962, 1965, they had a council, Vatican II in Rome. And their position of Islam, their, their official position regarding Islam is that it is a legitimate path to God. That's, that's official Catholic, Catholic canonized doctrine. Orthodox Judaism as well. And they say any religion after the flood is a legitimate religion. So I want to share just a couple of these verses in the Quran where all of mankind is addressed. Very unique aspect of the Quran. You know, it's not just like Paul's letters to different congregations the Catholic epistles to Christian congregations, the Old Testament, the God of Israel, the God of Israel. The Quran has a universal aspect to it. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min thakarin wa unta. O people, the whole of mankind, verily we created you from a single pair of a male and female. So, all of us are brothers and sisters. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he was the first person in recorded history to equalize humanity based on skin color. There's no one before him that said anything close to that, or using skin color. Paul said in Galatians, there's neither Greek nor Jew nor Christian, we're all one in Christ. He didn't mention skin color. The prophet says very clearly, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab, no black man superior to a white man, nor white man superior to a black man. Adam Adam is from dust, all of you are from Adam, and Adam is from dust. Equalizing. This is why Islam resonates with, for example, African Americans in this country. The most receptive group of people to Islam in this country, African Americans. Those marginalized, the subaltern, the deletes in India, the untouchables, right? When Islam entered into India, they would enter Islam and Masay. Why? There are more Muslims in India than Pakistan. Much more people don't know that. There was, a, there was someone the other day who, uh, what was this? I think this was a cow. Uh, I had a talk, and there was a, an American woman there, and she asked one of the Muslim students, where are you from? And, and, the, and the brother said, India. And she said, there are Muslims in India? Yeah, there's hundreds and millions of Muslims, more than Pakistan. Right? It finds a home in these places. And we made you into different tribes and nations so that you may get to know one another, to know, interact, to learn. Diversity is celebrated. The Prophet said, none of you will enter paradise until you believe, and none of you believe until you love one another. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. Verily, the most honored in the sight of God amongst you are those who have the most taqwa, the most God consciousness. That's a good translation of taqwa. Really, it's a, it's a love that's rooted in fear. Right? So there's two types of fear. There's, there's khawf, which is a fear that one has a bodily injury. Like the, the theologians say, if you're walking through a forest on a dark night, and you hear, ooh, ooh, you have khauf, you have fear of bodily injury. That's how some people worship God, and that's uh, a level to be trans, uh, transcended. We shouldn't downplay that, it's mentioned in the Quran. But then you rise above that to khashia, which is a fear of displeasing God. Right? So it's like a son, there are, some, there are some children that obey their parents because they're afraid of getting beat. I can't do that because my dad will beat me. Right? They're afraid of the whip. Right? And there are other children who will not disobey their parents because they love their parents so much 
that it'll hurt them if they knew that they hurt their father. This is called Khashia. This is how the Prophet worshipped God, how he worshipped his Lord. Shall I not be a grateful servant when he was worshipping until his feet were swollen red? This is the fear that I'm talking about. The most honored amongst you are those who have the most tough one. Another verse in the Quran. So that's chapter 49, verse 13. Chapter 30, verse 22. Woman ayatihi khalqus samawati wa Almost done here. And from his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. Wa khtilafu al sinatikum wa al wanikum. And the, the differences of your languages, your tongues, and your colors. So there's no Tower of Babel story in the Quran. Right? That diversity in languages and skin tone is a sign from God. I don't know if you guys remember this movie called uh, Robin Hood. The one with uh, Kevin Costner. What, what's it called? Not Men in Tights, but uh, <laughs> the, the Prince of Thieves, right? Yeah, I think it was a little before your time. I think it was 1991. Uh, there's a scene in that movie. It was panned by critics because apparently he can't speak with an English accent. But, or he refuses to, I don't know. Uh, there's a scene, Morgan Freeman's in this movie, right? A really cute scene where, you know, he's the, the Moor, right? And he's in Sherwood Forest, and this little tiny English girl comes to him. And uh, she says, did God paint you? <laughs> and he says, yes. And then she goes, why? And then he says, because Allah loves great variety. <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> so, Muslims operate under the Quranic principle of I'll end with this inshallah. Repel evil with beauty. The Quran says repel evil with beauty or something better. So we are not allowed to answer evil for evil. Okay? We're not sanctioned to do that. And we can see this in the life of the Prophet where he had people that were fighting against him actively fighting against him, trying to kill him for over 20 years, but at the end, he welcomed them into his community. Right? No one is actively trying to kill us. We don't walk down the street and people are shooting arrows at us. Right? At least not most of us. It's on occasion, I'm sure. Um, but we're so, we're, we're so sensitive. Right? There was a brother who came into the mosque, Christian brother, he came to the mosque and he was asking critical questions. There's nothing wrong with that. Critical meaning he was asking very Analytical questions. That's what it means to be critical, not to necessarily find fault. And there was another Muslim there who just, after five minutes, lost it and said, Why do you bring these blah, blah, blah into the mosque and get them out of here and this and that? And the poor guy was just like, You know, I just want to get away. You know, one of those moments. You know? And it's just like, and that was, that, that was his threshold, five minutes. The Prophet dealt with Abu Sufyan ibn Muhar, Amr ibn al As. Ikrama and all these people over 20 years trying to kill him, and in the end, he welcomed him. Them, right? So, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the example of the Muslims. And the Quran says, that he's a mercy sent to all the world, not just for the Muslims or the Arabs, for all the world, including all the animals. It's a very clear hadith. He says, don't, oh, don't, don't turn the backs of your beasts into. Uh, Manabira, into uh, pulpits. In other words, don't sit on your, your horse or your donkey or your camel and just start pontificating because that poor animal is holding your weight. Come down from your animal. So he gives animals rights. He said, La tasubudik fa'innahu yuqidun is salam. He said, Don't curse the rooster because he wakes you up for the prayer. <laughs> don't curse the rooster. <laughs> Imagine somebody like sleeping and like, because I've been in I've been in countries where the houses are mud brick and you can hear everything through the walls and many times there's no door and when that rooster gets going at five in the morning it's just like it sounds like thunder it sounds like a day of judgment <laughs> <laughs> you crazy guy I can't curse you <laughs> so we need to implement this imperative in fact we need to be ahsan implement the imperative. Now, I didn't tell you what happened at the end of my encounter here with the Starbucks guy. At the end of my encounter, uh, he, because he, at one point he lost it and said, you Muslims are violent and you want to kill people and this and that. And I was like, okay. So I was trying to calm him down a little bit. He didn't like my answers. And then he said, you know what, I'm taking a different angle. Why do Muslim women have to walk behind the men? What's up with that? 
You guys are misogynistic. <laughs> and he sounded just like Remember John Ashcroft? He was the Attorney General under Bush. I'm starting to think the only reason why he had that job is because he had a very scary voice. Do you remember his voice? He's like, Al-Qaeda. <laughs> In a world of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> yeah, remember, he, he had a good singing, remember, he like the Eagles. <laughs> anyway, what was my point? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, this guy says, you guys are misogynist. So I say, you know, there's, there's nothing in the Quran or Hadith that says that a woman has to walk behind a man. It's a cultural practice that originated in some Muslim country in order to make the women comfortable when they're walking around at night so there's no men walking behind them. So they would say, men, don't walk behind women and follow them around. It makes them uncomfortable. That was the point of that, right? Not because I think they're inferior. There is a story from the Quran where it says that Moses, it's all also in the Bible, Moses helped these two damsels in distress at a well, right? And then he was sitting there. One of them came back and said, my father, who is Jethro, or probably Shu'ayb, is inviting you to his house. So Moses, this is what the tafsir says. This is what the uh, commentary says. It says that Moses had a dilemma. He didn't want to walk behind her to make her feel uncomfortable. Because maybe he'd be looking at her, or she doesn't really trust him yet. She might, he might attack her. So he said, I'll walk in front of you, and you lead the way. And she said, how can I lead the way? So he said, pick up some stones and just throw them in front of me to go right and throw them this way to go left. He did that to respect her. He married her eventually. That's his wife, Zipporah. Right? Not because he felt And I explained this to him, this man here in Starbucks. And that was it. He sat down. I, I kid you not. He sat down, and there's 15 people there maybe. And he opened his little magazine. And then he turned around and he said in a very loud voice, you need to die. <laughs> die. <laughs> I said, ah, who needs to die? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, so I, I couldn't say, oh yeah, you die. So because I can't, I'm not sanctioned to do that. So I was shocked though, I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. I was sitting there like, and I look around and everyone's just going about the business, and being like oblivious, right? So eventually, like 30 minutes later, he comes back up to me, and he comes up behind me. And I didn't mean it like that. I meant like we all need to die <laughs> to see the truth. And I said, I accept your apology. <laughs> Without what is that? When you come into contact with those who believe in our signs, say, peace be upon you. Thy Lord has inscribed upon his own self the rule of mercy. So, we need to spread peace. We should say, salam alaikum to people. There's a hadith that says, towards the end of time, the youth will greet each other with insults. And you see this a lot. What's up, dog? <laughs> you try this like in the Arab world, walk up to an Arab man. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I don't think so. I said, what's up? What's up, fool? What's up, dog? Right? I, I was in San Ramon. I'll never forget this. I was going to my car, and I saw this girl walking right by me. She saw her friend. She said, hey, ho! <laughs> Not joking. Well, so with respect to character, we should spread peace. وَعِبَانُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَ وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا the, the slaves of the most gracious, they tread lightly on the earth. They walk with humility. And when the ignorant speak to them, like die, they answer with peace. They say salam. That's what I should have said. But I was so shocked. <laughs> so the Qur'an invites itself to higher criticism. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ do they not reflect deeply on the Qur'an? This is what we want. We want people to think about the Qur'an, to consider the Qur'an. So um, we have time for about 15 minutes, if you like, for Q&A session. I have to catch a plane at 9.30, so I have to be out of here in 15 minutes. And I also have to give more time because they're going to violate me in the little room there. <laughs> I have to prepare for that. Um, it's a mental preparation in the car. Um, so if there are any questions or comments, if not, I'm sorry if I was boring. Um, and, uh, yes, yes ma'am. Okay.
if it's for the patient, why does it say that whoever is in the pocket from the home, just be a client, will go to hell? And I didn't know what to answer. I didn't know. Yeah, I understand the question. Uh, in, that, in that instance, I would ask for a reference. Right? If she said, whoever doesn't believe in the Prophet Muhammad will go to hell, first ask for a, a reference in the Quran. Where does it say that in the Quran? Now, the theologians have difference of opinion as to what happens to non-Muslims. Okay? This is an issue that's highly nuanced. Okay? And they've debated these issues for a long time. There's an orthodox opinion it's a valid opinion, orthodox opinion, that says that people who are not reached by a sound prophetic summons, in other words, they weren't reached by the prophet's message in a good form, then they're not responsible to become Muslim. That's a valid opinion. That's an authentic opinion. That's not my opinion. This is a 1,000-year-old orthodox Muslim opinion. That if someone was told their whole life that Muslims are terrorists, and Islam is evil, and they're, they, they worship an idol, and things like that, and that's all this person was told. According to this opinion, that person is not responsible to even become a Muslim. It's a very highly nuanced issue. God is just, okay? This is very important. God is just. God is not going to put people into hell forever and ever and ever until they really deserve it. It's, in, in fact, very difficult to get into hell forever and ever and ever. In fact, the word uh, kafir, which means unbeliever, right? In reality, a hostile unbeliever. Uh, the root meaning is a farmer. A kafir is a farmer. It's used in the Quran as farmer also. Because a farmer will cover his seed, right? So a kafir is someone who covers the truth while knowing the truth. Allah says in the Quran, describing kufr, describing infidelity, unbelief. Saying, do not cover the truth with falsehood, nor clothe it while you have knowledge of truth. Okay? So, um, we're not allowed to say to anyone, you're going to go to hell. We cannot do that. that. That is against our religion. Because we don't know the end of people. Right? The, the end matters. I'm trying to keep myself out of hell. That's why we pray for a husn al khatima. You should pray for a good ending. Because right? that's what it's going to come down to. We don't know how people will end. One of the early salaf said, "Inna Allaha khaba'a wilayatahu fi khalqi." He said, "This is uh, Imam with Zainul Abidin, uh, rahimahullah taala." He said, "God has has concealed His saints, His awliya, amongst the creation. So be very careful how you act towards people." Many of my teachers were non-Muslim at one point. Now they're my teachers. Now they're world-class scholars. At one point they were non-Muslims, but Muslims at one point showed them love and concern and, and, and mercy. They weren't condemned, right? So we have to be careful about that. Imam Qurtubi, a great scholar from Al-Andalusiyah, he said that when Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the companions of the Prophet, when he was prostrating himself to idols, he was beloved of God because God knew his end. What was his end? He's buried next to the best of creation right now. He's buried next to the Prophet The Prophet said, this is my companion in the dunya and in the akhirah. Right? So we have to be very careful how we talk to people. We should be very concerned about ourselves and concerned for others also. And not in the sense that we're going around judging people. It's not our tradition. You know, sometimes you see these guys on campus with a sandwich board and a megaphone. You're all gonna burn in hell! You're gonna burn in hell! Burn, 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 burn. <laughs> or you see Muslims, right? They walk by men, okay, that beard is that that's a Muslim right there. <laughs> <laughs> Start measuring beers. There's an opinion amongst Imam, Sh Imam Shafi'i, who is a codified Imam of jurisprudence, one of our champions. His opinion is if, if, that if you shave completely, it's makru, it's not haram. That's a valid opinion. We have to be very careful who we condemn. But you have like the, the beer police, the pant leg police, you know, the hijab police, <laughs> and it's and you know it's very easy to condemn a woman that doesn't wear hijab because it's something that's outward. Right? It's in your face. But, you know, what's in that person's heart? It's, it could be worse. We have to think about this. al ghibatu ashaddu min zina is a hadith. That backbiting, talking ill of someone behind their back, is worse than fornication. Do we think about that, though? How often do we backbite? 
you know, we won't commit zina, of course. You know, alhamdulillah, was no, no way. La taqrabu zina. Don't even put yourself in a position. Don't even come near to it. But, you know, she said, he qala wa qila. He said, she said, he said, she said. It's all ghiba, right? It's worse than zina in reality. In reality. But we don't see the reality. Um, so I would, to make a long story short, I would ask for a reference, and then I would explain that God is just, and this is a nuanced issue that the theologians um, have debated over. Um, so, we're not allowed to judge anyone. The only people we can say for certainty that are in hell, with certainty, because we stop where Allah's messenger stop. We don't speculate. Fir'aun, Pharaoh, Haman, Qarun, Abu Jahal, right? A few other people. I mean, how many people? Are six people? I mean, come on. You know? So, we should, uh, we should not be so judgmental. And uh, the brother's standing up, which means I need to sit down now. No, no, no. Just, just a question. Oh, yeah, question. Just really quick. You, yes, sir. You kept using the term, like, three eternal meanings. Yeah. What does that mean? Ah, uh, whoa. That's deep. Um, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has al-qidam al-dhati, which means that he has an essential pre-eternality, which means that there's no beginning to God, because he's outside of time. There's no past, present, and future. Okay? Uh, there's no beginning. There was, no, there was not a time when God was not. He was always there. Therefore, all of his attributes also have this attribute of pre-eternality, because there are his attributes. So the kalam of God, the speech of God, which is reflected in the Quran, and reflected in the Torah, and reflected in the Injil, the meanings behind the script also has pre-eternal meanings that are infinite, because God is infinite and pre-eternal. That's why God cannot be matter, it can't be substance, because science tells us that you can't get something out of nothing, you can't get life out of death, right, or life out of nothing, and axiomatic truth in biology is what? Life from life. Right? So where did all this matter come from? There, has, there had to have been a beginning. There had to have been someone or some entity who's outside of time, who is not made of matter, who created this. Something related, like, so we shouldn't tell people, like you said, that the speed, like the, I forgot how you described it, you said, like the codex of the Quran uh -huh. indicates upon the, yes. the personal speech as reflected in, like, yeah. I guess, like, should you not say that it is a speech of, like, you should, it yeah. is a speech of God, right, technically, but, or, I don't know. You can, you can say it's the word of God. Um, it's permissible to say that. But if you want to be technical, um, if you want to be technical, you would say that it's an indication of God's word. It's an expression of God, God's word in the Arabic language. Because ultimately, God does not speak a, a human language, because God is not human. He's completely dissimilar to creation. But we call it God's word because that's, uh, that's how we're accustomed. Um, so yeah, I can, and on, the co on the cover of this, it says the Holy Quran, but in reality, it's the Mus'haf, the Quran. The Quran is the recitation itself. So th that's an issue that um, the vast majority of Muslims will never even hear of. The reason I brought it up is because we're talking about the relevancy of the Quran today, and that's directly correlated that the Quran transcends 7th century Arabia because of that reason. The pre-eternal the pre meanings are infinite and can be applied. And that's not my opinion. You can see this with experience. That's why, again, 20,000 people in this country become Muslim. It's still working. Whereas if you look at what happened with the Christian Europe when they started printing the Bibles, when the printing press was invented, there was a Protestant Reformation, and then there was a massive atheist movement that's still affecting Europe. They just left. They said, no, we don't, we don't believe in it. It's not relevant anymore. Any other last questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so I well, it was allow you to comment and then listen to your uh, opinion about this comment. About the uh, question of the sister that uh, sometimes come in a different version. Is it okay that I don't become a Muslim? Or is I'm fine if I didn't believe in the Quran and Prophet Muhammad? So the way it came to her, your answer is very correct in my understanding. but. Mm -hmm how to answer it in this way. Because many people meet you as a Muslim and say, uh, I can be fine to remain as a Christian or a Jew. Mm -hmm. So what, what I would think of is, you can be fine, as you said, if uh -huh. you never knew and got the message yes. of Islam clearly and accurately. But 
I'm going to give it to you now, and then I start speaking mm -hmm. and explain what Islam means. I mean, if he's a friend or, yeah, yeah. or someone who's ready to listen. Yeah. There's a point I want to raise, and I want to listen to what you're going to say. Yeah. When someone asks you this question, like the sister, it's the duty on you to explain to him or to her what Islam is. Of course. Yeah, that's a good point. I would, I would quote the Quran. The Quran says, وَلَا تَقُولُ ثَلَاثَ Don't say Trinity. إِنْتَهُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Desist. It is better for you. It is better for you not to believe in the Trinity. We believe that. That's our faith conviction. That Islam preaches a radical monotheism, which we believe is the teaching of Christ himself. And that Trinitarian belief is a later outgrowth that was decided upon by various church synods by vote um, many hundreds of years after Jesus came upon and walked the earth. So uh, I agree with you. I would say that Islam, and this is not a politically correct statement, but I don't really care because I believe it, that Islam is the best way of life, that Islam is a superior uh, set of beliefs, that it's more authentic. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be Muslim. That doesn't mean I don't respect other religions. It certainly doesn't mean that. Okay. But we as Muslims, what does it say in the Quran about Muslims? Kuntum khayra ummatin. A lot of Muslims, they push the pause button. Kuntum khayra ummatin. Pause. We're the best people. <laughs> Don't worry about the rest of the ayah. <laughs> what does it say? Kuntum khayra ummatin. Ukhrijat lin nas. You are the best people for the, you are the best ummah for the people. What does lin nas mean? All of the mufassirin say, this means for the service of mankind. You're only great because you serve people. How do you serve people? You give them the message, you give them the guidance. That's the only reason why. Ultimately, the most important thing is guidance of people. So this is ironic that we're only superior when we think, when, we're, when we serve people. We're only, we only become the masters when we become the servants. Right? So it's, it's inverse. Um, uh, so that's, that's the point, is that I totally agree with you. We should use opportunity. Uh, relate for me even one verse. We should take opportunities to present our team. And if you're not a good speaker or a good orator, um, I don't think I'm a good speaker. Sometimes the best thing to do is just have good character, just to smile, you know, or give them, if somebody asks you a question like that, give them a, a reference to somewhere, to someone that can answer it more adequately, you know. So, um, so you know, it's, 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 a, it's a question of sensitivity. But we have to be sincere. People, people at the end of the day will respect you more if you have principles. If you're not just, you know, whatever. It's all the same. Kumbaya, my lord. If you say, I respect you, but I think this is superior, they actually will respect that more at the end of the day. You take a stand at your, at your work and say, I'm not going to happy hour. Every week on Friday they ask me when I was, when I was an accountant at a company that shall remain nameless. <laughs> Every Friday, you come to happy hour? I'm going to drink alcohol. I'm never going to go there. Okay, next week. You come to happy hour? Um, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Next week. You go to happy hour? It got to a point where I said, you know what? Next time. And they kept going for next time. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to stop here because uh, he has to catch a plane. Yeah. Um, you guys would like Qurans? We have three Qurans over there. Shalom, Zach. And Zach,